What's up everyone, Kevin Carrillo here and welcome to another episode of the Cananaboid Connect Podcast. My guest today is Morris Beagle, president and co-founder at We Are For Better Alternatives. What's up, Morris? What's going on, man? How are you doing today? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm, I'm really excited to be talking with you today. Um, you truly are one of the trailblazers when it comes to hemp innovation um, in this country. So, um, yeah, man, thanks for making time for me today. I appreciate it. Of course. Happy to talk. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you mentioned you're out in Fort Collins. Yeah, Fort Collins, Colorado. I grew up in Loveland, which is just right up the road, about ten miles. So, oh yeah, I know, I know Loveland real well. Um, I have a, ba- a wrestling background, uh, and so oh, really, yeah, there was a lot. In fact, I think one of the world team members uh, is from Loveland, Tyler Graff. Shout out to Tyler Graff. Yeah, well, Loveland has actually always had a really good wrestling program. When I grew up, I graduated from Loveland High, but there was always a handful of guys in the Loveland area that were like going to state and winning state and, you know, really top quality wrestlers. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the scene like out there? How, how's, uh, how's quarantine been? How's your family doing? Uh, we're doing all right. You know, we're making it through. We just got back from Oklahoma and Kansas. We lost our mom back in May. Who She had been sick already as she had stage four lung cancer. And anyway, they put her away really away in, in an assisted living facility where we couldn't see her and then she passed on May 17th and uh, my other brothers are out here and we actually just did a road trip to Beaver, Oklahoma and to Liberal, Kansas, where, actually where I was born and my brother Dave was born in Liberal, but uh, Beaver's just right up the road like 30, 40 miles and my brother Brad was born there and that's where my folks were from. So we went and laid the parents to rest together and, and just did the brotherly road trip. So it was kind of cool. Wow. Well, that's great that you were able to uh, experience that with your brother. And um, I'm sorry for your loss. I know you mentioned that before we started recording. So, um, you know, um, I'm sorry about that, you know. Well, appreciate it. You know, she lived a good, healthy life. Well, I shouldn't say a healthy life. She smoked a lot of it. And that's what uh, eventually led to her demise. But she was 83 years old and she had a good life and a good family. And we've been really fortunate just to have a good family life and had great parents. And, you know, we're grateful. Nice. Yeah. Well, that's, hey, you can always just look back on the good times and, and um, how they brought you together and, you know, focus on that. So that's good. Exactly. Yep. So, um, you know, speaking of what's been going on recently and, and sort of the craziness, I mean, you're, like I mentioned, you're a trailblazer, you're a hemp entrepreneur, an advocate, an educator, and the president of We Are For Better Alternatives, which um, is basically a, a, a they're family brands that, that consist within that, that parent company. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. WAFA, we started in 2015. We actually started Colorado Hemp Company in 2012, which started as like a hemp merchandise company doing t-shirts and hats and apparel type merchandise. And then from there, we started Tree Free Hemp doing hemp paper and printing and then we launched NOCO Hemp Expo in 2014 and then we needed to have kind of an umbrella for all these brands that we started to develop from merchandise to events to paper and printing and so we started WAFA which is like the collective body the family of all of our entities that we created up until this point which is like a dozen or so now which over half of those are events. Right. And before we dive into each one of those entities, because I, I really am excited to talk about them, especially the, uh, the Silver Mountain Hemp Company, where you actually make and produce uh, hemp guitars. This is so cool. Um, but w- before we talk about that, I know that you have a strong um, background in music and entertainment. So, um, you know, what, what inspired you to make that pivot into the hemp industry? What, I guess what parallels did you see? Um, among the two? So I did come up through the music industry. My brother, Dave Beagle, is a really accomplished guitar player and had a band called Fourth Estate, which was a progressive instrumental rock band back in the 80s that was kind of along the lines of Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and the Dixie Dregs and 
then kind of King's X and Dream Theater. So kind of just real progressive, hard instrumental rock stuff. And I went to the Music Business Institute in 1988 in Atlanta and got kind of this general background of production and distribution and copyright and publishing and really kind of like this jack of all trades, general education to get myself into the music industry. And then I went and worked for a large music and video distributor in Atlanta, and then got moved to California and then came back to Colorado in 1995 and started Happy Scratch Records, which was a one-stop shop doing studio production and CD and DVD manufacturing and printing and product distribution and events and booking and promotion and licensing. And again, kind of this jack of all trades, master of none, um, be good at most everything and being able to kind of place people around me that are better than I am at specific things. Um, but what happened in the music industry is here comes the internet. You've got Napster and mp3.com and then all these peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks that everybody started getting all their music digitally for free and it really impacted the physical media business which was directly really where I was making my revenue and so the CD business kind of collapsed and all of a sudden all these record stores went out of business and which in turn put all the distributors out of business and then all the labels. Right and I, I remember those days like the LimeWire days right where uh, exactly Demonoid, LimeWire, all that stuff, Pirate Bay. Oh man, that was the the wild wild west. You talk about those days. It was, you know, you'd have your you'd ha you'd be downloading a file for you know four hours, eight hours, maybe even ten. You know, sometimes if it was a movie file, it was cra depending on your internet speed. But yeah, and those you know, LimeWare gave me a lot of uh, viruses too. I remember. So uh, in the end, I don't know if if I if I gained from that or not. But <laughs> right, those things weren't very safe, depending. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, so, okay. So the, the, you know, the, the, the notion or the tangible CDs are kind of obsolete at this point due to the internet boom. Um, so go ahead, continues. So really have between 20, oh, 2005 and 2010, things really just kind of went downhill and it was like, you know, what's going to go on. And so I started to look for other options because the, uh, part of the business I was in, and I just saw the business kind of collapsing. Was there any place that I could go that I could take my skill set? And then the cannabis thing started happening here in Colorado with the medical side of things really picked up in like 2008, 2009, 2010. And then by 2012, we had Amendment 64 that legalized adult use for Colorado. And we were the first state to really do it, us in Washington. Um, but within our legislation with Amendment 64, it allowed for the for the farming and production of industrial hemp. And it's like, hey, I was familiar with hemp. I had read the Jack Harrod book in the 90s and I wasn't really doing anything in the hemp industry. There you go, the emperor. And uh, okay. is that the new version of it? This is the new version. Um, I'm, I, I finished it recently and I'll tell you what, man, it is excellent. Um, and I want you to expand on that a little bit because I did do some prior research and I listened to some of the previous podcasts you were on and read some of the articles you've been featured in. And um, yeah, let's talk about your, 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 you know, you, I guess let's first say you, you describe the industry as a lifestyle brand, right? Or a lifestyle. Um, the hemp industry is like a lifestyle. It's similar to the music and entertainment industry. Um, so how did this book inspire you to really look at hemp and say, Hey, there's a lot of potential here. Um, well, just to, I, I would say that, yeah, hemp is a lifestyle industry. It's also, you know, it's going to be working within multiple industries where some of it isn't as lifestyle, but where I position myself is really from the lifestyle, cultural, social change part of it and promoting all aspects of it, which is also the business side of it, where it's going to eventually get into the commercial use side with paper and plastics and in big commercial industry, which isn't as lifestyle. It's just another freaking commodity. Um, but going back to this and reading the Jack Hare book and seeing all the potential applications that I had no idea about, I was a cannabis recreational user. I mean, that's where I got into cannabis in high school. I've been a recreational user. Um, I did become a medical user in 2009, 
or 2009, why did I say 20? Anyway, 2009, 2010, I got my medical card. And I had had back surgery in 2001 and you had to use opiates and Vicodin and Percocet and all that stuff. And, and I really never used marijuana as, uh, as a pain side of things and medically. And then I started to, and it actually worked. And it's like, I don't need to be taking Vicodin and, and that sort of thing. But right. kind of going back to this lifestyle thing and, and how we positioned ourselves and what we're doing, I, I do see this as an opportunity to expand lifestyle because hemp can be utilized from a health and wellness standpoint, which is obviously lifestyle. Um, you know, therapeutics, the, the dietary supplements. Again, the health and wellness side is definitely lifestyle. Apparel is lifestyle. Um, just thought process of being able to bring virtually everybody under one roof and being one big tent, all inclusive. I see that um, as lifestyle and I see the entertainment industry as being a portal and a, and a stage to, to spread this message, you know, far and wide. Mm -hmm. I like the way that you put it where you say uh, it's, it's like this umbrella that we, this tent that we can all get under. And um, I recently had Sarah Yetman on uh, and she kind of, she echoed that same, that same narrative. Um, and, and her viewpoint is, is that industrial hemp can save small, small town America. You know um, the fact that the competing, you know, petroleum and wood industries, um, they're just not as efficient and, and sustainable as hemp. Um, so, you know, what do you, what do you think about that perspective? I do think that that is, that's why I got into it. I do believe that. Um, I think that we're, it's going to be a, a while till we actually get there. I mean, we see this, you know, there was all this momentum and then all of a sudden we kind of had the, the air let out of the balloon, so to speak with the crash of 2019, we've got all this material in the marketplace and you know, what was, 50 to 100 to 200 dollars a pound is now less than 10 dollars a pound and there was this great hope and promise that people really i think there was a lot of false hope in there because of cbd and the cannabinoid side which really was never the initial push of the industrial hemp movement it's fiber and grain and making this big long-term social and environmental change and all of a sudden everybody got really excited and now there's going to be this lack of enthusiasm because a lot of people have lost their money and they didn't, you know, they banked the farm on it, but that's what happens in agriculture. And this is agriculture. And once this dust, dust settles and the pandemic comes to an end and we come out on the other side, we're going to be looking at fiber and grain and, and growing this like we grow corn and soy in a rotational manner. And hopefully in conjunction with all these other crops and making our agriculture a lot more biodiverse than this kind of monocropping that we seem to have done really now that I just learned since the 1920s. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to Oklahoma, what happened there then created this Dust Bowl. People should actually take a look at the Dust Bowl. I don't know if anybody has researched the Dust Bowl, but now that I went out to Beaver, um, from 1930 to 1940, we just had an ecological disaster in the Great Plains. And it's because we farmed all this land and tilled it for years and years and years and grew all this wheat. Um, and it became very productive. But all what we did is we, we killed all the soil and it became dirt and it wasn't living soil that it was before because we plowed it all up. And then all of a sudden, the, the climate change, droughts happened, and then all this dust happened. And it was just absolutely crazy stuff, which I had no idea about it. But it was a man-made ecological da disaster because of our farming practices. And if we look at what's happened the last 30 years here with corn and soy and all this stuff and how it's killing our rivers and our lakes and poisoning our oceans, and I mean, it's not good. And we have to make a change in farming practices across the board and stop doing it the way we've been doing it with monocropping and spraying all these chemicals everywhere across our food because it's we're going to have a cataclysm like we've never seen as humankind before and it's going to be all our fault mm -hmm. yeah no i couldn't agree more and i think one of the the first real major steps that the industry the industrial industry uh, industrial hemp industry needs to make is you know ensuring that infrastructure is in place you know, um, as you mentioned previously, there were a lot of farmers in 2009 that had that, that, that promise of, you know, we're going to make a lot of money with this crop and this and that. And, and it, they were easy, easily able to grow it. But 
um, when it comes to processing and extraction and whatnot, the, the infrastructure just wasn't there. So a lot of these farmers kind of missed out on, on that, right? Um, Correct. Yeah, the, the processing infrastructure is still not there. We've got quite a bit of capacity when it comes to extraction. But now we've got all this more material, more material than the market can support currently. And that's been largely due to the FDA and how they've not really laid down regulations and properly, you know, put the foundation out there where investors and retailers and everybody feels comfortable. They've just been putting out this ambiguous, you know, hemp's not a supplement or CBD is not a supplement. It's not a food ingredient. And until that gets clarified, you know, there's just going to be a holdup on that. And we certainly aren't there with infrastructure for fiber and grain at this point to make this into a fully commoditized crop. But that's going to change over the course of the next two, three, five years, 10 years. We're, this infrastructure will be built out. It's going to, you know, everybody's going to take a step back now, let the dust settle, and then we're going to move forward. And, you know, a lot of people that were here the last couple of years aren't going to be here in a couple more years because they, it's like they threw in the towel and maybe they'll get back in. But it's going to be, it's going to look a lot different here in the next three to five years than it has the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's go back to the, um, you know, I can relate to you in the sense that for, with this book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, you know, reading that one chapter where they talk about all the uses of hemp. Um, it really blew my mind because, you know, I, I just had the initial idea that obviously you can use it for medicinal purposes, you know, your ropes, your twine, clothing, things like that. But, you know, they start talking about building materials and biomass energy um, and paintings and canvas. And so for, for our audience for who's just kind of learning about this, um, why don't you help bring it full circle in terms of, you know, talk about the history of and all the applications of hemp and then, you know, how this crop is so sustainable in that it, it helps our environment at the same time. Hmm. That's like a big question right there. You can, <laughs> um, well, we have used this crop for thousands and thousands of years. I think that history books show that um, ones that are legitimate, that th this is, this material has been in use since, you know, the early Chinese and in Africa, and really all across human history from textiles and food and rope, cordage, um, you know, to sailing the seas, to coming to America, to, to colonizing America and covered wagons, um, clothing, paper. I mean, paper was the first material used to make paper in China. Theoretically, was hemp. That's what that's what we think. That's what the record shows. And if it wasn't, it was certainly one of the first materials, one of the main materials that was used in paper making throughout the first seventeen or eighteen hundred years that we had paper. Until we figured out how we could utilize other materials that maybe weren't as difficult to process, and that's what happened with wood and juke and and other materials, cotton for clothing, and some of this mechanized processing for other crops started to happen. And, and then, you know, the, the things that change. Um, I think hemp and cannabis was always just like one thing. I mean, this, this plant was used medicinally um, and it was used for all this stuff. So it was kind of the wonder plant. People didn't look at it back as, oh, this is hemp and marijuana until, I don't know, whenever it was really defined that way at the end of the 30s or 40s or even into the 70s and, you know, it was always one plant until here we decided to make it more than one plant. Right. And, and, you know, that's when, when the government stepped in, obviously within the book, they talk about how cannabis was then named marijuana. Right. And it was associated with minority groups and reefer madness and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it really was a, a play to, to make the plant have this, this bad stigma attached to it. Correct. Yeah. So um, after that, so we've kind of confused the plant, right? In a sense where we've, we've started to name it three different things and, and have put regulations around those three different definitions as well. So we're kind of further complexing the plant, in my opinion. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I would agree. It's, um, this is a very unique plant. 
the, the uh, you know, arguably the most unique plant on the planet and the most diverse plant on the planet, where A, we can use it as a recreational drug, if you want to call it that, where it can intoxicate you. And then we can use it for all these other things um, from food and building materials and, you know, building houses to bioplastics, to making guitars, to making clothing, building vehicles, fueling vehicles, um, other energy applications. So how do we, the regulation of it, I guess it's just one of these things with government where, I mean, it's, in the end, hopefully, the way that we do this as a movement, that we get to a point where it's all end use. It's all cannabis, and whether it was 30% THC or 0% THC, all parts of the plants can be used, and if it's going into somebody's body, then it's regulated at that point of processing and manufacturing, and it's going to be compliant. That All of the waste usages of it, regardless of what any sort of THC percentage was, that should be irrelevant. This plant is a useful plant and all that material should be able to be put into industry and into applications where it can be utilized. I, I love how you put the end point. Like, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's, 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 it produces a product that can have regulations behind whatever that product is, right? Whatever category that falls under. Um, uh, people, I think it's important for education and understanding about those endpoints so that even if they don't want it around or they don't want to consume it, um, at least they understand the value of it, right? And the fact that the plant has zero waste to it. Correct. Yeah, I mean, if I want to go into a dispensary and buy 20 or 30% THC flour or a concentrate or whatever, I can go in there and I know that I'm going to buy a product that is regulated correctly and that compliance has been followed. Or if I go into Whole Foods and I see shelled hemp seed or I see a CBD product or a CBD, you know, that's consumable or something that I would put on me as a topical, I'm going to feel confident that that's been regulated properly to get there and it's safe to ingest or put on my body. Mm -hmm. um, but if, at the same time, things are regulated differently that if it's going to go into the wall or to the guitar or into this t-shirt um, where you're not doing anything for human consumption, it should be regulated that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this, if it was grown from a 20% THC plant, should be handled no differently than cotton or any other flax or anything else that you would make a t-shirt out of. Right, right. No, I agree. And that is a cool t-shirt, by the way. Uh, yeah. People that are just listening, Soundgarden. <laughs> rest in peace, Chris Cornell. Yes, rest in peace. Um, so let's talk about your, your, your companies. Um, we Are Better Alternatives, obviously, is the, 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 the umbrella company for uh, the family brands, which include Noku Hemp Expo, your Southern Hemp Expo, Silver Mountain Hemp Guitars, and let's talk about hemp media platforms. Um, so I, I want to talk about Silver Mountain first, if you don't, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Hemp guitars, man, that is so cool. And I think you said you have one right behind you. So for those that are that are watching the video, um, can we get a look at that? So there it is. So this is a hemp body. This is hemp wood provided by the Hemp Wood Company, HempWood.com in Kentucky. And then you can see here. So we've got a, the top half. In the back half is hemp wood, and here in the middle, this is Canna Grove. This is a hemp particle board produced by hemp traders and Larry Serbin out of California. And so this is a 100% hemp body. And this guitar strap, which we actually have hemp guitar straps too, but this is a 100% hemp guitar strap made by Levi's. Levi's got a handful of 100% hemp guitar straps. Um, so it's really cool. And I just got these in last week. So this is the very first podcast show that I am actually showcasing these in person. I just got them. They're going to be on for, they are on sale now for custom order. They're going to be starting at $3,000. They are a bit pricey, but it's a boutique guitar. It sounds great. It's well built. They're all really good components. Um, it will stand up to other $3,000 guitar players or guitars that are out there. Um, yeah. 
You heard it here. You're yeah, we're excited. You're seeing it first right here. <laughs> right here on your show. That's awesome, man. Um, so, so tell me about the, the process of making something like that. Um, and these are probably going to be dumb questions because I know nothing about uh, the production of guitars. But um, is it, is it, does it take a little longer because it's a, a boutique and a product? Or is it about the same amount of time? Like what, what all goes into it, basically? Well, this has definitely taken a while to figure out this particular process. And I've got a couple of guys in Atlanta, the French brothers, who had been making guitar cabinets for me. And you might be able to see some of them back here behind me. Mm -hmm. um, I, ha I got these guitar cabinets in last year, and that's all made with the hemp uh, canagro that's in the middle part of this. So it's a hemp particle board. Those are like three quarter inch. I think that's half inch that's in the middle right there. Um, but these guys have been making custom cabinets and they're master woods crap woodsmen and stuff like that and so they've been developing this process with the hemp wood and it's taken about six seven months to figure out how to properly put these things together and and what part of the the hemp plant is used i know you've got the fiber the hybrid fiber and, fiber and herd are separated right so um what what is actually produced to make plastic? Is it the herd or the fiber? Uh, it can be made from both on those. This, this, the guitar that I've got here has both herd and fiber. It's, it's full stock between the materials that are in there. Got you. Okay. Okay. And no flower, just the, it's all hemp stocks. All hemp stock. All the, yeah. And so what, um, is there a difference in terms of the way it performs compared to your traditional guitar or, um, not not really there's a tonal difference and what that difference is i'm not exactly sure yet because i did just get these in i just got in a couple of our combo amps as well and now the process is going to be we're going to set up in a studio my brother's got a really nice studio and he's got tons of amplifiers tons of cabinets a ton of guitars and we're going to start a being a bunch of different cabinets against these and that and, and just really giving it a solid test drive over the next six months. And I'm going to have lots of local guitar players playing it. I've also got some national name people that are interested in playing on these things. And so we're still in the R and D stage. We are going to be producing these now, but we will still be tweaking along the way and, and improving as they go. But from where we're at right now, they are really high quality instruments. That's so cool. They, they look it. And uh, I can't wait to, to see the progress of those A-B tests. Um, if you're uploading those to YouTube, I'll definitely be subscribing to y'all's channel and, and sharing that content. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, this sounds better than this, this, and this. Um, it sounds good. It's loaded with, uh, again, really good hardware and they, they play well. The necks are really good. Um, tonally, you know, guitar players are very, subjective and they're you know they like what they like and they're in what they hear in their head and some people like stuff that's bright some people like stuff that's more mid-rangey some people like stuff that's a little darker so everybody's got a, a very taste in what they like to hear i get it i get it there and there's some people that don't embrace change either right they're a little uh slow to adapt and and uh grow with with the times and i think that you know that's just a perfect example of one application for hemp but there's hundreds of thousands of applications right um that we've just kind of talked about so do you see maybe uh silver mountain hemp making other instruments out of hemp in the future ukuleles so we do we did do some ukuleles with another builder the last few years and we're looking to try to get more of those made so yes ukuleles for sure um, potentially drumsticks, um, cajones, uh, you know, the little hand drum stuff. So we're looking at different hand drum uh, instruments. Um, we're going to do some basses probably in a bass cabinet. So we're going to continue to expand. I like the the bongo drums that you mentioned, because at least that's something that I can play. You know, I, there you I, go. I told you I'm, uh, I'm not music illiterate. I mean, I'm music illiterate. So uh, those will be easy for me to, to perform on. <laughs> So let's talk about NOCO, uh, the, the NOCO Expo. So I know you started that. It's a hemp convention that you started in 2014, right? Correct. So, so you know, what, what is that, the mission of that 
that conference um, and what, what activities are included in it? So I guess the mission is, was really to build this as a kind of a foundational industry event where people could come to once a year and it would be the, the central hemp event. And we started it before really anybody else started doing something with that intention in mind where we could bring together the industry, um, all parts of the supply chain, uh, provide educational conference tracks, uh, sessions uh, to, to learn about all aspects of the industry, but also provide a forum to the general consumer as well. So we're kind of a hybrid show between the industry side and the consumer side. And it's been that way since the start, and it's still that way, and, I, and we plan to keep it that way because the public needs to be educated um, along with the industry as we're figuring out how to build an industry. Um, and I think that by doing it this way, um, we've been able to, to bring people over from the consumer side that really find the, uh, the passion and desire to, to be part of this movement. And they, they see that this crop and this plant can really provide positive impact on the world. And, you know, people are looking for change right now. It's, you know, we live in strange times where people are sick of corporate America. And it's like, God, what do, I don't want to look back on my life and say, God, I didn't do anything to, to help my kids or fellow humanity. And, and I think a lot of people from all aspects of life are moving towards this plant because they feel that this thing can actually positively impact humanity and our planet. And, and we've seen that with our event. And that's, that's part of the event is being able to show the opportunity and, and what could be if we could all come together under one roof inclusively and utilize this plant as a vehicle to move our society forward in the right direction. Hundred percent. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually a living testament of that of that narrative that you just mentioned. You know, um, I have a, a long background in corporate America, and um, it just wasn't fulfilling, right? As as um, what I've I've wanted out of life. So, um, seeing the legitimacy of the hemp industry and the farm bill being passed in 2018, and and with all this chaos and craziness going on now. You know, now's the time to really um, start to educate and inform people about the opportunities potential that this industry has, you know, um, economically, um, for free trade. I mean, all this kinds of stuff, um, the medical benefits, it just the list goes on and on, you know, and that's part of the reason why I started this podcast and I'm having experts on like you to, to talk about it. So um I, I love that mission and and the fact that y'all are including the consumer side is great because uh, I recently at attended the Texas hemp convention back in January before COVID hit and uh, it was very industry heavy you know there wasn't as much I was really learning the industry from the business standpoint while I'm still trying to figure out you know what the cannabinoids were and what you know CBD was and and the medical benefits of it so um, I, I love that you guys are differentiating yourselves that way. Yeah, I was actually at the Texas Hemp Convention. We were a sponsor there and had a booth there. Um, I had a hemp guitar there too. I don't know if you had stopped by the booth or saw that or not. I, I it was it was pretty big, and we we stayed like half a day. So we oh, okay. get to every booth. I'm not sure. I don't. I would. I definitely would have remembered it if I saw a hemp guitar. But um, I was with guys that were were networking and you know actually trying to to do business deals, so. Right, it was definitely more business focused than it was hybrid like we do. And the, the Kush.com guys that put that on, I thought that they actually did a really good job and they do the Oregon Hip Convention and we've worked back and forth together. So they're, uh, you know, they're a friendly co-promoter that's doing a lot of great things out there as well. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was a great experience. I did learn a lot. The one feedback I would say from a social media marketing perspective is their hashtag was THC 2020 or something like that, um, which just further kind of confuses hemp and, and THC or, or adds that stigma to it, you know, so that would have been my only feedback is to, to stay away from that. But <laughs> yeah, people have used THC for the, to tie it into hemp and Texas Hemp Convention, THC, but there's also you know, the Tahoe Hemp Company that has THC, they're a retail store in Tahoe. And Rick Kranz, the guy that owns that, he's been doing the hemp thing for like 25 years. He's, he's awesome. <laughs> nice. But I agree. I, I, I agree with you on that. This, you know, there is a separation between marijuana and hemp when it comes to the marketplace. One's regulated this way, 
the other one's regulated this way and that's just the way it's going to be and and that's something here in Colorado that we're still fighting is this uh you know confusion of marijuana and hemp I mean they they are regulated differently that's just the way it's going to be and this plant will be regulated differently depending on the application yeah. And, and we talked about it earlier. I mean, it's not ideal. And, and I even complained about it, right? We're further confusing uh, the plant, but it, it is what it is at this point. And so if we have to work within those, those guidelines, um, it's only going to help everyone from an, from an education standpoint, you know? Right. Again, it's a super diverse plant. It's complicated, um, but it's amazing and can do more than anything else can do on this earth that we are aware of at this point. I know it's, it's, it's incredible, man. And I think the more and more that people see that and realize it, um, it's going to be better off. We're going to be better off as a, as the human race, you know, for sure. Yes. Um, so I want to ask you, obviously NOCO, uh, is an in-person expo, right? So how have y'all, uh, pivoted during these times? Are, Are you doing it virtual? Have you had to reschedule? Um, so yeah, we did have to reschedule. We were supposed to do it at the end of March and we pushed it back to August, which was actually supposed to happen this last weekend. Um, but then we had to push that to 2021. But what we did when we initially pushed it back to August is we pivoted straight to the cloud and we did a Earth Week event. And we kind of did it in conjunction with Earth X out there in Texas, because we were supposed to be out there during Earth Week, part of the Hemp Village. Um, that Mark Linde was part of. And, and I was mentioning Mark to you before. We'll throw out a, out a quick shout out to him. Oh, yeah. Um, hemp guitar picks, 3D printing. He actually printed the hemp pen that uh, Mitch McConnell signed the farm bill with or what eventually became the farm bill. That is um, a- Mark was a pioneer in hemp plastics and 3D printing. And so he's a good friend of mine. And unfortunately, he left us last year. And, you know, we love you, Mark, and you were a great inspiration to a lot of us in the industry. Rest in peace, Mark. Thank you for all your uh, contributions to the industry. We appreciate you. Yeah. And uh, so back to that. So we ended up pivoting into the, into the cloud, and we did this Earth Week virtual trade show and conference and found a platform, bought into a platform for a year uh, licensing fee and uh, had multiple live sessions. We had a library of content. We had virtual expo halls. And we were really kind of the first in the cannabis space to jump into that and do something that was pretty cool and got like 1,500 people to show up for the event and a lot of great content, a lot of good feedback. Um, We then did a summer solstice event for another three or four days uh, over the summer solstice week. Um, And a lot of great participants. We had like 30 five, 36 speakers that were part of the live sessions and another several dozen that, com- that submitted pre-recorded content, again, various aspects of the supply chain, networking rooms, 60 plus exhibitors in the virtual hall, um, solid event, but it's not a live event. You know, the, all this virtual stuff that a lot of us are trying to do, it keeps people together. It's, it's keeping communication going but it's not the same as a live event. And I think we all know that and we're doing the best that we can with what we have to work with during this pandemic. But I tell you, I sure look forward to live events again soon, hopefully soon. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, there's just something about being face-to-face and, and interacting with others in the industry and, you know, uh, or, you know, being introduced to another person when the, which you've met or, you know, it's just, it's a whole different dynamic as opposed to being on a webcast. Uh, but, you know, we're all trying to navigate through these weird times. So um, it is what it is right now, you know? Yeah, but at least we, you know, we can have a conversation here and look at each other, which is great. And if you're doing a virtual conference with and you got 20 or 50 or a couple hundred people in the audience and you got three or four people talking at a time and you can put forth a lot of good information and have good interaction and have questions answered you know there's still plenty of value there Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um do you want to talk about the other companies um that that you're involved with so let's talk hemp and the uh southern hemp expo i guess you already mentioned that um but let's talk about let's talk hemp so let's talk hemp is our media platform it's let's talk hemp media and it's let's talk hemp.com and we're actually in the process of launching a new website right now 
and a new formatted newsletter. Um, we're really kind of ramping up our whole media side of things. We're also going to be launching a new podcast. I've done a podcast with Rick Trojan for the last three seasons, and uh, Rick's kind of doing his thing. I'm doing my thing, and we're going to launch a brand new thing sometime in October. Um, but it, this started out really as kind of the programming arm and mechanism for NOCO Hemp Expo in our event side of things, as far as doing panels, doing keynotes, and, and creating education. And it's since kind of expanded into a, a digital magazine, a weekly newsletter, uh, providing original content, uh, curating content from across the globe from various publications, um, and just really being a resource for hemp information and education and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, uh, that, that's really kind of what, you know, it's news, it's information, it's lifestyle. Um, it's trying to be a hub of, of good content for the hemp industry. Yeah. And we, we need more of it. So that's great mm -hmm. that you're doing that. And, uh, and the podcast will it be called the same thing. Let's talk hemp podcast or. Yeah, it was let's talk hemp in the four two two where every day is earth day. Uh, but it's just going to be the let's talk hemp podcast. We're going to kind of strip it down and do a new format for the show and, and hopefully tech, take it to the next level. Great. Well, I can't wait to check that out and subscribe once you guys are getting going. Um, well, Morris, I mean, like I said before, you're, you're a pioneer uh, in the industrial hemp uh, industry right now, especially it, at it being the, the forefront. And um, I, I just want to thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything else that you want to talk about or leave the audience with before we sign off? Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, I, I, hopefully people will stay positive out there. We're in very trying times. Uh, we've got all this political unrest, social unrest, uh, industry unrest, if you're in the industry. Um, but I think that if, if people focus and have the awareness and have the right intention, and we, we're all knowing that we're gonna get through this together, um, that there is hope for mankind and society, hemp and cannabis is gonna play a big part of it. And we're gonna need as many smart, uh, rational, compassionate people to be part of this movement to to actually create societal change so i'll leave the audience with that we want you on board we need the the best and the brightest and, and people that want to make a positive difference well said well said sir thank you so much again for your time um, and continue doing what you're doing we appreciate your work hey thanks kevin i appreciate you having me on the show and good luck to everything you're doing let me know if you need anything Thank you very much. I will. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye.